Okay, let's get started here. So you said if you so what formula would you use? Her. So y is equal to p, which is our put down amount, which is a hundred. E is just a number raised to the interest rate point one three five. And time in the account is six. And then you just type it into your calculator. Twenty-nine. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. Next one. So we'll do this one. So given f of x is that, g of x is that, find f equals g of x at f of eight. So you would plug in eight for f. So f of x is at 8 is 6, correct? Mm -hmm. So then this becomes 6 is equal to x squared minus x plus 4. Then how would we solve it? Good. Get it equal to 0. Way to remember that. So we have x squared minus x minus 2, correct? And then you would solve it by factoring. What multiplies to be negative 2 and adds up to be negative 1. 1 times 2, negative 2. So it quick factors because our leading coefficient is 1. So x plus 1, x minus 2. So x is equal to negative 1 and x is equal to 2. Perfect. Next one. Number 3. Go for it. Okay. So you should have this. X is equal to 8 over y minus 3, solving for y. Algebraically, there's many ways we could do this. Okay, multiply by y minus 3 to both sides, so technically it cancels out over here. Now solving for y, correct? So we've got this. Right? So we would distribute that through. No, we wouldn't. No, we would Oh yeah, let's just do that. That would make it harder. So we have y minus 3 times x equals 8. Good point. That would have been a bad idea. Divide by x. Good point. So y minus 3 equals 8 over x. And then add 3. Perfect. So y, so you would say g of x, because we found the inverse. g of x is equal to 8 over x plus 3. The restriction is x cannot be... Zero. We can't divide by zero. Very good. So, we're going to do two lessons today, and then next time we'll review, and then we'll test. So, um, 10-3, we're going to be talking about samples and surveys. So, a population is all the members of a set. A sample is a part of the population. Um, so it says, if you determine a sample carefully, the statistics for a sample can be used to make general conclusions about a larger population. Um, so basically, guys, a population can be many things. So, for example, this, gra this group of people here, we'll call this a population. Now, taking a sample would be picking a smaller piece of that entire population. That would be a sample of the population. And if we pick the sample appropriately, then we can... You do some study on those people, and then we can make general conclusions about the entire population. Um, so you just have to be careful. So for example, a population of kittens, this would be a, an example of a sample. Everybody understand? Okay, yeah. So you can get good statistical information about a population by studying the sample of the population. Because in reality, guys, um, we can't, a lot of times a population is so large that you can't talk to everybody. So that's when you would need to pick a sample. Um, suppose you want to know what percent of all voters in your city favor a tax increase to pay for school improvements. This is a good example for us. It would likely be impossible to ask the opinion of every single voter in a city. So instead you would select a sample of voters to estimate the percent who favor the idea. And then you can get an idea from that. Does that make sense? In general, we can say that yes, they are fine with increasing taxes to help out Westlake High School, for example. Um, so you can define different sample types by methods used to select them. Sorry, I'm going to say that one more time. 
you can define you can define different sample types by the methods used to select them. So that's the first thing we're going to talk about is how you can select those samples. Because we just talked about you've got to select them very carefully to really be able to make general conclusions. So on your little note thing, you don't need to take notes because you've got the paper that already has this. But we need to really take it in, and a lot of these make complete sense. So everybody looking. So for a convenient sample, if we have a population and we want to take a smaller sample of that population, for a convenient sample, um, select any members of the population who are conveniently and readily available. So that's what's a convenient sample. It's convenient. That makes sense. They're conveniently and readily available. Makes complete sense. Um, for example, me going to the grocery store and talking to everybody that walks in. That's convenient. Just like, do you get what I'm saying? That's considered convenient because I'm going to a place picking people that walk in the door. Yeah. Um, so for a self-selected sample, selects only members of the population who volunteer the sample. So for example here, um, the mayor, I work, you know, I work um, for the Marriott at Thanksgiving Point here and there. And it's really big in the hotel industry for us to send out surveys to people's emails, like saying, how was your stay at our hotel? And those go out randomly. However, the only ones we get back are the people who choose to then fill it out. They're self-selecting. I want to fill out the survey. Does that make sense? So it's only the people that choose to come in and write in the survey that get submitted. Not everybody that we send it out to gets submitted. That would be a self-selected sample. They're choosing to take the survey. Um, so for a systematic sample, um, you order the population in some way and then select from it at regular intervals. For example, if I had a phone book and I said, I'm going to call every third person in the phone book. You see how that's a system? Coming up with a system. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In a random sample, all members of the population are equally likely to be chosen. There's no system. It's just random. So samples vary in how well they can really reflect the population. A sample has a bias when a part of a population is overrepresented or underrepresented. That makes sense. A bias is a systematic error introduced by the sampling method. For example, most people that write into the Marriott are mad. If you're happy, why bother, right? That's how most of us feel. Like, I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to go and say good things. But if there's something bad, I'm going to make sure to write that dang survey. So our surveys at the Marriott are generally only if people are mad about something. So really, overall, can you say our hotel is crap based on just the surveys? No, because it's only the mad people that are coming. So that would be a bias. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, so you have to be really careful, and it's kind of murky on what's a good sample and what's not. I'm not a statistician, so we'll do our best. Okay, so now what I want you to do is we're going to we're going to determine what kind of sampling method here. Um, so it says a newspaper wants to find out what percent of the city's population favors a property tax increase to um, raise money for local parks. What is the sampling method used for each situation, and does the sampling have a bias? To explain. So everybody read this, and then you're going to tell me what sampling method they used here. So in A, it says a newspaper article on tax increase invites readers to express their opinions on newspapers website. You're going to decide in a second with your groups which bias it is. Then a reporter interviews people leaving the city's largest park. What kind of sampling method is this person doing? A survey um, service calls every 50th listing from the local phone book. What kind of sampling method? Ready, go. Decide for all three of them. There. Okay, I'm going to delete this one. Okay. So this, a newspaper article on tax increase invites readers to express their opinions on a newspaper's website. This is self-selected. How many of you said self-selected? Good. Awesome. You saw it. That's true. Um, it might have a bias depending on who visits the website. The people who respond may overrepresent or underrepresent some views. For example, some property owners who are against the tax might organize a campaign to get friends and neighbors to visit the website. They might say to their friends, or you go onto the website and vote for this. Just like you see that happening all the time, right? <laughs> okay. On B, it says a reporter interviews people leaving the city's largest park. Um, good. A convenient sample. Way to go. So since it's convenient for the reporter to stay in just one place, 
Um, it's a convenient sample. Because the location is near a park, the sample may overrepresent park supporters, and the results will have a bias. Guys, if we're sample, it just. Well, right up here it says we're trying to raise money for local parks. So that person, if they want parks, people to say yes to parks, they're going to secretly run and ask everybody that's at the park because they know they're going to say yes. Does that make sense, everybody? Yeah, so they, it, yeah, that's. So a survey, a survey service calls every 50th listing. That's obviously systematic, right? You said systematic? That one's not random. That has a system to it. This is systematic. Da, 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 da. It says the phone book was listed alphabetically. Um, the regular sampling intervals is every 50 listings. The sample may have a bias if there is some link between people who are listed or not listed in the phone book and people who pay property taxes. So, Yeah, kind of. That's what makes it hard is it's like there's not one right answer. Because at the same time, like, Every 50th person, that's pretty good in my opinion. You know what I mean? But that's my opinion. I'm like, I don't really know if there'd be a bias there. But Yeah, if, it, if there was a, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, that's, but see, that's what's hard. I, I mean, I don't know. There, there's not one right answer. Okay. So, to serve the eating of a community, employees of a local television station interview people visiting a food court in the mall. What sampling method are they using? Convenience. Convenience. Good. Does the sample have a bias? They're eating food, right? Yeah. Well, I there's some good stuff. Just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, you're right. And the second reason is to pick up on. Honeys. That exact thing? Wow. Okay. All right. So a poll of every person in a population is a census. That's like crazy. So a poll of every single person in a population is called a census. What is a situation that requires a census instead of a sample? I don't know. You tell me. Anyone? Yeah. That means literally asking every single person. That's true. Okay. But that's one where they tried to make it more of a census, right? They tried to get every single person. Can you think of a different one? Do they still do that? That's interesting. So they used to go knock on everybody's door and then count, I mean, no, figure out how many were in the household. Interesting. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. Right. If you missed a neighborhood, that could be, yeah, true. Yep. It would have bias. Okay. Um. So let's do these ones. This is a sampling method I Bias. This is fun. A wants to find the persona shopper to use coupons. A manager interviews every shopper entering the greeting card aisle. That's a convenient sample, probably, because they're just in one part. Now, the bias is like, in my opinion, like it's over representing people who buy greeting cards, obviously. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so you're underrepresenting maybe a certain age group. Good point. Okay, a maintenance crew wants to estimate how many. Oh, listen to this one. This one's a good one. So a maintenance crew wants to estimate how many of 300 L air filters in a 30 story office building need replacing. The crew um, examines five filters chosen at random on each floor of the building. That's random. <laughs> <laughs> but that's 3,000 air filters. So they're like wanting to know in general how are our air filters doing in this building. So would you say that has a bias? Nope. No bias. Yeah, I uh, usually know. No, that one was random. It says they were randomly selected, not every third. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, let's move on. We're almost done with three 10 1. Uh, I mean, 10 Whatever. Three. 
Okay, so now guys, if you have a population and then you pick a sample, now you have to do, okay, I picked a sample, a smaller piece of the population, now you have to perform a certain study on that, on that um, sample. So there's different types of study methods. Once you've picked your sample, what kind of study are you going to do? An observational study is you kick back and watch. You measure or observe members of a sample in such a way that they are not affected by the study. So you just secretly observe. You do nothing. You don't do anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's an example the book gives is like somebody going into nature and watching. Yeah, a bird watcher. No. So that's kind of, that's an observational yeah. study. Yeah. True. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Right. Okay, a controlled experiment. You divide the sample. So let's say we pick these people. Divide them in half. Ah. Oh. Okay. Well, we'll go to the kittens. Divide them in half. So you divide the group in half. And then one's called the control group, and the other is just the, the group you're comparing them to. So it says, let me read it. You divide the sample into two groups. You impose a treatment on one group, but not the other control group. Oh, never mind. So the control group is the one that you don't do the thing to. Cool. Yeah. That's a, yeah, exactly. Sorry, so our control group, oh yeah, and then the treated group is the, yeah, obviously then you look, you compare the control group to the, the treated group. That makes sense, yeah, okay. So you give this kitten treats for a week, um, fattening treats, and this one, nothing. And you see if it gains weight. Okay. Okay. Then there's a survey. So let's say that you pick some, you pick this sample and you do a survey. So you ask every people, every member of the sample a set of questions. So we picked this, these people and asked them all the same questions. Does that make sense? Okay, a poorly designed study can result in unrelatable, um, unreliable statistics. You should always analyze a study method. You should always analyze a study method. But what is Why can't I read in here ever? Methods. Before, I swear there should, should be a comma in there. You should always analyze a study's methods, comma, before making general conclusions about the population. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's observation. I believe it. Okay, hey guys, focus so we can get through this. So it says, which type of study method is described in each situation? So it says, Researchers randomly choose two groups from 10 volunteers. Over a period of eight weeks, one group eats ice cream before going to sleep and the other does not. Volunteers are monitoring devices while sleeping and researchers record the dream activity. Researchers. So, well, and that's, that's the thing. They would look at the data and make conclusions. So, what kind of study was this? Let's see if you're right. This is an example of a controlled experiment. The statistics for the study are based on such a small sample that the findings are unreliable as a general conclusion. Yeah. Yes. Well, so, guys, does, and, like, what kind of, so, first of all, it says a researcher randomly chose two groups from ten volunteers. So, wasn't this a self-selected sample? Just making sure. Cool. Okay, next one. It says... Students in science class record the height of bean plants as they grow. They didn't do anything. It's observational. So it says, um, let's read this because we got to know. It says the statistics may provide a general conclusion about, about the growth rate of a bean plant. However, soil type, amount of sunlight and water, fertilizer, and other factors could affect growth rate. Okay. 
Student council members ask every 10th student in line if they like a cafeteria food. Yeah, it's a survey. It's systematic and it's a survey. Good. Way to go. You guys are so smart. Now, what, what it says is the results are not reliable because people waiting in line are more likely to enjoy the cafeteria food than those who brought their lunch from home. Yeah, but it could introduce a bias. Hey, how about this one? A pharmaceutical company asks for volunteers to test a new drug to treat blood pressure. So the volunteers will be given the drug. This is what is really done in real life most often. You hear it on the radio all the time. In fact, I hear them like a kid in my a kid in my class that he's getting his wisdom teeth out like in a week for an experiment like this. Exactly. It's gonna be for a pain medication, yeah. Yeah. So it says half of the volunteers will be given drug, half will be given the placebo. The researcher will monitor the blood pressure of each volunteer. Which type of study method is the researcher choosing? It's a control experiment. Yep, good. It says two of the sample statistics used to make a general conclusion about the effectiveness of the drug in a larger population. Yeah, it depends on, yeah, it depends on how they get people. So if they are going to an old folks home and getting everybody to come from there, it's going to overrepresent old folks. But if, it just depends. If they're getting a bunch of different ages and randomly selecting people, I think it's probably good. Yeah? Cool. Oh, don't do that. Mm -hmm. So, turn number four is we're going to be looking at normal distributions. So, remember last time we saw if you have a mean and then standard deviations, all of your data values will fall within some number of standard deviations away from the mean. So, we're going to be dealing with standard deviation and mean again today, but of normal distributed data. So, many common statistics such as human height, weight, or blood pressure gathered from samples in the natural world tend to have a normal distribution about their mean. A normal distribution has data that vary randomly from the mean. So here's my mean. Data that varies randomly from the mean. The graph of the normal distribution is a normal curve. This is called a normal bell-shaped curve. So do you see how it's a symmetric bell shape here? So some statistics will have this distribution. It will have this bell curve here. If your um, data is normally distributed, it'll have this bell curve, and this is always going to be true if it's normally distributed. So 68% of the data will fall within one standard deviation away from the mean. That will always be true for um, normally, dis uh, normally distributed data. So everybody look. Here's my mean. Here's one standard deviation below and one above. So 68% will fall... So it's cut in half, 34 and 34. You're going to want to kind of get that memorized. Oh, then 95% of the data will fall within two standard deviations. So almost all of the data will fall within two standard deviations. So then think about it. If this whole distance here has to cover 95%, you take 95 minus 68. And then you divide it evenly. So that's 13.5, 13.5. So right here in this section within two standard deviations, in this section, that's 13.5% of the data will fall right there. And right there. And then 99.7% of the data will fall within three standard deviations of the mean. So almost all of the data, pretty much all of it, will fall within three standard deviations of the mean if it's normally distributed. Uh-huh. Yep. So the, no, it's on already. You already have it written down on that little paper. So then, between here and here is 2.35. So then, think about it. 100% of the data. So I took 100 minus 99.7 as 0.3, and I divided it by two. So we'll fall without outside of three standard deviations. 0.3. But then, okay. That just always was true. Like it statistically is true. Okay, so, um, but for that to be true, it has to be normally distributed. Okay, so sometimes data are not normally distributed. A data set could have a distribution that is skewed. An asymmetrical curve in which one end stretches out further than the other end is considered skewed. So this is positively skewed, 
And this is negatively skewed. If it's a normal distribution, it'll be have a perfect bell-shaped curve. So you can say those percentages are split up evenly. But you can't do that if it's skewed data. Not super important, just making sure we understand that not all, everything is normally distributed. Everybody good? Not that important. So I didn't say this to this class, but I'm going to say it now. Remember how we talked about outliers? If something falls outside of two standard deviations away from the mean, it's considered an outlier. That's fine. Okay, so look at this example. This is very similar to the one on the homework, and it confuses people. Do you see how this is a normal bell-shaped curve, everybody? Okay, so um, it says approximately, so this is showing female brown bear weights. So look over here. Over here is the percent of bears from 0 up to 50%, and then right down here is the weight. So it says approximately what percent of female brown bears weigh between 100 and 29 kilograms. So let's see, 100. So that's from there. Oops. That's from there over, correct? To 129. So then up to there, correct? Everybody seeing this? Yeah. So now we're going to go ahead. It says what percent of brown bears? So you're just using this. Let's add up the percent. So 24. this is about 24%, you'd say. And then what's this? 42. Okay. Good enough? 24. So add those up. Four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. 90%. Okay. Okay, hey, now let's do this one. So it says, sketch the normal curve. So that didn't have to do with the percent down, you know what I mean, the normal distribution. We, they weren't asking us what percent fall within one standard deviation of the mean. Does everybody understand we were not being asked that? Okay. Okay, so looking at this example, it says, for a population of male European eels, the mean body length and one positive and one negative standard deviation is shown below. Sketch a normal curve showing ills at one, two, and three standard deviations away from the mean. This is what you would do. You're going to be drawing a bell curve. So we know this is our mean. So you would draw your little bell curve, everybody, like this. So I didn't draw very symmetric. Yep, right down the middle, our mean is 15.7. Now then from there, one, so I looked at this and I saw that our standard deviation was 2.8. How did I figure that out? That minus that. Does everybody understand? Same as... Yeah. That minus that. Everybody understand? So then one above, one below. So this is one standard deviation below, one above. What percent should I put in here? 34%, right? Okay, so then this is 12.9. This is 18.5. Can you get your calculators going for me real quick? Let's go more than that. Let's go out. I said to go out three standard deviations. So our second standard deviation out. You'll subtract the standard deviation. So do 12.9 minus 2.8. 10.1. Um, perfect. And then what percent was that? 13.5%. So let's do one, one more above. I, you really are going to want to spread this out so your data it doesn't get confusing. Anyways, this is 13.5%. We'll fall there. And then right down here, this is with the out three. So I'll subtract 2.8. And that was 2.35. I'm writing too small, but. 24.1. Yeah. So we've drawn out um, three standard deviations from the mean. Here's my mean. So if I said to you, what percent of ills will fall between the weights of 10.1 and 12.9? You would say? 13.5%. 13 13.5%. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. Sweet. Um, is that all that easy? Do we need to do another example or not really? So do you see? Do you see what I'm saying? Though the only thing it's going to ask you is what percent 
is between this and this. So let me just make sure we understand. So if I said to you, looking at this normal distribution chart, what percent of eels are going to weigh below 21.3? Below? Below 21.3. Wouldn't that be all of those? Yeah. So wouldn't we just add them up? Yeah. But then you have to add up 0 0.15 too. Does that make sense? 0 0.15, 0 0.15. So it's that easy. Like literally nothing harder. If we need to do another example, we can. Okay. Finish the worksheet then. That's it. Yep. And to make sure that we're good for the homework, this is my last question. Let's say, hey, listen, let's say there was 200 eels. Caught 200 eels. How do you spell eel? Okay, let's say there was 200 eels. How many of those eels can we expect to weigh 12.9 between 12.9 and 15.7? 34%. So how many eels? When you just do 200 times 0 0.30? 3.4? Does that make sense? You would say 68 eels. Because I asked you, it, out of 200 eels, if we can expect this to happen, because it's normally distributed, how many can we expect to weigh between that and that? Okay. Okay. That's it.